Good morning, friends. Welcome to Wake Up in the Word for a Monday. We hope that you, as the cup says, will be strong and courageous in the Lord, as the psalmist reminds us. And we are ready to face another week with all kinds of challenges ahead. Stuff's going on in this world, and it is affecting you. Well, while we're getting back into the Gospels today, the life of Christ, join us in Mark chapter 8 and Matthew chapter 16. Before we get there, though, I do want to say it's great to be back home. It was a wonderful week last week as we were at the Celebrators Conference again with Phil Walter at Ministries, and then at the end of that week, of course, a somber time, but actually a wonderful time with some family as we celebrated the life of my Aunt Bernice Bailey, who passed at the age of 90 after living a life that was just such a blessing to so many people. It was good to see Clay and Betty once again spend some time with you guys, other family members and friends there at the Presbyterian Church in Covington, and just recognize how God had blessed us all through the life of Bernice Bailey and how we can celebrate something we're even going to talk about today. The fact that we know the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the single most infallible proof of all history that guarantees the promise he gave us of eternal life after this one. So with that in mind, we're going to get to a passage that shows how the Pharisees and Sadducees, the religious leaders of the day, were rejecting Jesus and still even though he has given them every reason to believe, they're still saying, well, if you'll show us the right sign, we'll believe. What are we talking about here? Pick up in Mark chapter uh, chapter number 8, verse 11, where it says the Pharisees came and began to argue with him. So it's gone from just asking questions to now they're arguing with him, demanding of him a sign from heaven to test him. In verse 12, it says, sighing deeply in his spirit, he said, why does this generation demand the sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to this generation. Then he left them, got back into the boat, and went to the other side. Now, that's the very short, succinct version that Mark gives of an incident also recorded by Matthew. And Matthew gives us a little more uh, of an insight into the discussion beginning in the first verse of chapter 16 in his gospel. It says, The Pharisees and Sadducees approached and tested him, asking him to show them a sign from heaven. Well, he replied, When evening comes, you say, It will be good weather because the sky is red. In the morning, well, tomorrow will be stormy because the sky is red and threatening. Well, you know how to read the appearance of the sky, but you can't read the signs of the times. Now, it's amazing that in those days, of course, you didn't have meteorologists, but the local folks have always, down through history, learned to read the signs that they could see, including how to predict what the weather is going to be like today or tomorrow. So, yes, they were involved in that. And, of course, the religious leaders of the day, especially since the calendar of the Jews is based on the moon. It's a lunar calendar, unlike ours, that is a solar calendar. And so they were constantly watching for those signs. Some of the feasts actually had symbols that you had to watch for when the moon rose, etc. So they were quite efficient at that. So what Jesus is saying is, hey, you guys are great when it comes to weather forecasting. You can see those signs, but can't you recognize the signs of the times? Now, he's hitting at them on a couple of levels. Number one, the scriptures from the Old Testament, especially Daniel's prophecy, gave a specific time frame when Messiah would come. He's trying to say, don't you recognize that it's time? But then secondly, can't you recognize the times and the signs of the times? Something that you should be able to see quite Honestly, because it's so plain to you who are supposed to know the scriptures. The forerunner has already been John the Baptist. He proclaimed that I was coming. I am here and beginning at my baptism, nothing but positive signs to demonstrate that I'm Messiah. Keep in mind, by this time in Jesus' ministry, he's already fed the 5,000 at one point, the 4,000 at a point that we just saw. He has already 
cast demons out of people. He's healed people in so many different ways. There are so many testimonies about that floating around. He's even demonstrated his power over nature. He has walked on the water. <laughs> I mean, what has Jesus not done, including the fact that he has already raised the dead? So in light of that, the Pharisees, with somber looks on their faces, look at Jesus and say, yes, but give us a sign. Jesus is having none of that. Matter of fact, he says in verse 4, as we pick back up in the scripture, that an evil and adulterous generation demands a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. And then he left them and went away. He'll refer to this again in the scripture, so we'll pick up with a little more detail on that later. But obviously, the sign of Jonah is making reference to a time when he will be, as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish, he will be in the grave. And the end of that will be his resurrection. So the greatest sign of all is coming. And if you can't believe that sign, which by the way, most of the Pharisees and Sadducees did not, even when that happened, if you can't believe that sign, then look, there's no hope for you. How many signs can I put out that you can reject? Look, sometimes it's just a matter of the heart because the heart that may be evil and wicked and has chosen chosen ahead of time to say, nope, not having Jesus as my Messiah, well, then what sign will convince you otherwise? Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul points to how important the resurrection is to our faith. Picking up in verse 12, don't want to read that whole passage. It's quite lengthy. He said, now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? It's amazing. Already in the first generation of Christianity, there are some apparently at the church at Corinth saying there is no resurrection. Well, what are you even doing here? The whole point of the church is to proclaim the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So he points out this contradiction. He says in verse 13, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. If Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain, and so is your faith. Moreover, we're found to be false witnesses about God because we've testified wrongly about God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless and you're still in your sins. Those then who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. If we've put our hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone. But as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For just as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. He goes on to give us that fantastic declaration about the resurrection through the rest of chapter 15. And, and in that, he ultimately says death, the last enemy, will be put under his feet. Death, where's your sting? Where's your victory, grave? Oh, oh, no, all that's been put aside. Why? Because we've received the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ has been raised. So, friends, if you're looking for signs, there aren't going to be any new ones, not about Jesus being the Messiah. He's already given plenty of those. You just need to go with it. Say yes to Jesus. Recognize that he needs to be Lord in your life, Savior in your life, and then you begin the great journey of faith. But until you're willing to say yes to Jesus, don't be demanding that God's going to give you another sign. Look, just you know, knock me, knock me off my chair with some bright light and speak to me audibly. Listen, God's not going to do that. Why? He's already given you more than enough signs and signals through history. He's just waiting for you to decide what you're really going to put your faith in. I hope today that'll be in Jesus for you. Well, thank you so much for spending some time with me today. Hey, we'll do this again tomorrow as we wake up in the Word. Got a busy week. We'll be seeing our friends in uh, Hendersonville and Columbus today as we get back on the work trail. 
a lot to be done around here. We'll touch base with that a little bit tomorrow. So meantime, you pray for the folks in Western North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, all the other places, Florida, that have been affected by these hurricanes. And pray for these disaster relief workers that are busy even today trying to make a difference in the lives of people. And I'll see you again right here tomorrow when we wake up in God's Word.